this is really groundbreaking work and it's really changing and developing new understandings of what's happened here. So um, it, we're really honored to have you here, um, Dr. Stews. It's really great to get a chance to hear you explain your book, which is uh, available in all of our libraries. It's titled um, The Indigenous Paleolithic of the Western Hemisphere. So um, you are currently serving at Algoma University as a Canadian research chair in healing and reconciliation. So you're wearing really big boots and we're really thrilled you could join us tonight. So welcome. Thank you. Uh, just give me a second to uh, share my screen. So um, Tansi, hello in Cree. I acknowledge I am currently a guest living and working in the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe and Métis communities of Northern Ontario. I am honored to be here and to teach and carry out research on the land that Chief Shinwak dedicated for an educational facility specifically for the education and benefit of Anishinaabe people. So Tansi, you know, my name is Paulette Steves. I am an Indigenous Cree Métis archaeologist. I am a faculty in sociology and anthropology and also in geography, geology, and land stewardship, for which I am the chair at Algoma University. Um, my research is focused on Pleistocene archaeological sites, that's archaeological sites older than 10,000 years before the present in the Western Hemisphere, the Americas, and rewriting and reclaiming Indigenous histories. My research is framed in ceremony. Research framed in Indigenous method and theory is based on respect, relationality, and reciprocity, and is relevant to Indigenous communities. It is a praxis that weaves through institutional and public spaces to create social change. My place in being a part of this ceremony of research and in telling this story was told to me within a discussion I had with a Salish elder, Leonard Sampson in Lillooet in 1988. I met with Leonard to seek his advice just before I moved away from Lillooet under great duress as a newly separated single mother of three children with a minimal education. Leonard told me that he and the other elders in the local community who had known me since I was young had watched me grow up and had discussed my future. Um, Leonard was very gentle in telling me that the stress I was going through at the time was training. He said I had to learn to deal with even more difficult situations I would face in the future. He also stated that what I had been given to do would lead me to do work that would reflect on and help Indian people. He said, not just our communities, he said all Indian people everywhere. What Leonard uh, reminded me of in his talk that day was my responsibility as an indigenous woman to all my relations, to all beings, to the land and the water. At the time, I had no idea where I would go or what I would do. I have been given many signs over the years that this research is a part of the path that I was formed of by Leonard Sampson 24 years ago, though it took me as many years to understand the meaning of his message. In sharing details of who I am, I claim my ancestry, acknowledge my ancestors, and declare my position as a researcher and an author. I intentionally locate myself as a, <clears throat> an indigenous person first and a researcher second. I present this introduction as a respectful way of creating a relationship with listeners before I share my story. Archeologists, have created many stories regarding the indigenous past of the Western Hemisphere. However, they very rarely, if ever, have talked to indigenous people or nations about their own history or their ties to the land. Indigenous people's deep histories on Turtle Island have been denied by archeologists for over a century. 
archaeologists' denial of indigenous links to the land prior to 10 to 12,000 years ago has cleaved First Peoples' links to their homelands and created them as recent immigrants to the Americas. Archaeologists have often discussed the indigenous people of the Western Hemisphere as Asians from Asia, but I like to remind them that Asia did not exist 12,000 years ago, nor Asian as a distinct cultural identifier. The first people and their descendants are indigenous to the continents of the Western Hemisphere and have been so for thousands of years. The Western Hemisphere is where their cultures, identities, and life ways were born. This is where they are from. In the early 1900s, Alex Herlishka, who was the first physical anthropologist at the Smithsonian Museum, argued that Indians had only been in the Americas for 3,000 years. And then in the late 1920s, Jesse Figgins, an archaeologist from the Denver Muni Museum of Science, found a stone tool in the rib of an extinct bison near Clovis, New Mexico. That particular stone tool technology, which you see on the screen here, became known as Clovis. Clovis points are very easily identified because they have a large chute taken out of the middle, a large flake. Um, as Alex Herlishka was an archaeologist, though, at the Smithsonian, that's the National Museum of the United States, his opinion held great prominence. And Jesse Figgins had to go to great lengths and fight for a few years to convince archaeologists that people had been in the Americas for at least 10,000 years. And he knew that because the bison where he found that stone tool embedded in its rib had been extinct for over 10,000 years. So the archeological story of America's first people argues that the first people to enter the Americas walked across a land bridge from the area we know today as Siberia in the Eastern hemisphere near the end of the last glacial maximum around 11 to 12,000 years ago. Archeologists created a story about the first people calling them the Clovis people after the Clovis tool that was documented at the site in New Mexico. You have to remember though, a cultural group or a community of people is defined as a group of people who share language, traditions, cultural practices, and life ways. Nowhere in the world is there a known cultural group that is larger than a small regional area. So archeologists discussing the first people of North America as a single group called the Clovis people were inferring a cultural group that covered a continental wide area uh, across North America. And what they did was erase the diversity of different communities and cultures throughout North America and create one Clovis people. And, but Clovis were not a people and they were not first. They were not a cultural group. Clovis was a tool type that was shared among many cultures. So the Clovis people is really a, a Western creation of a fictional cultural group that erased diversity of indigenous peoples in the Americas. The only place the so-called Clovis people ever existed was in the wildest imagination of the archeological mind. So there are uh, some non-indigenous or settler archeologists who have spoken out about racism and bias in archeology span and how it has erased indigenous history in people. In 1987, Don Fowler, an American archeologist wrote an article called Uses of the Past, Archeology span in the Service of the State. And uh, he argued that um, it is clear that archeology span has been used by nation states and their actors and institutions to interpret the past to suit nationalistic goals and to elicit passive support of citizens for state agendas and policies. So there are some uh, settler or non-indigenous archeologists that have been very supportive and have spoken out about racism and bias in American archeology. span 
What we know from the archeological record of human history on a global scale is that human history has never been static. And we learn more every single year, specifically since science has greatly improved our ability to read soils. We learn more about the story of the human past as it has always been evolving. We also know that human history was not a simple or single story. Early people were very, very intelligent and adaptable. They moved across the continents and around the world in many ways, including land migrations and journeys across large bodies of open water as early as 80,000 to um, 100,000 years ago. So what I have found through my research is that there are hundreds of pre-Clovis or pre-11 to 12,000 year before present archeological sites in both North and South America and evidence of mammalian migrations between the Western and Eastern hemispheres across millions of years. There are archeologists who have reported numerous, numerous archeological sites that date to earlier than Clovis. Settler archeologists that have supported earlier uh, dates for indigenous people in the Western hemisphere have faced severe scrutiny and academic bashing from their peers for reporting their radiocarbon dates from archeological sites that were earlier than Clovis. The violence against archeologists reporting earlier sites in North and South America was so great this area of archaeology was called an area of academic suicide. This denial of earlier sites has and continues to limit funding and research into earlier archaeological sites in the Americas. This has not happened anywhere else in the world. It has only had a well-documented record of such bias and violence in North America. So this is a couple of maps from my book, and this isn't all of the sites that I know of in North and South America. This is a selection of sites that date till earlier than 12,000 years. Um, and it's important to take a look at this. So you can see that people were in the very Northern part of Alaska and the very Southern, Eastern and Western areas of both North and South America prior to 12,000 years ago. Okay, so um, here, here are these maps. And like I said, people before 12,000 years had already settled pretty much every area of all of North and South America. So the, uh, you probably can't see the color. The green dots on this map are younger than 22,000 years. The yellow dots are older than 22,000 years. So there's a collection of sites older than uh, 50,000 years here in Southern California and in Central Mexico. So what did the world look like um, 12,000 to 24,000 years ago during the last glacial maximum? Well, the Northern part of what we know today as North America was covered in ice. There was as much as three miles of ice on the land connection between the Eastern and Western hemisphere. So we know this was not a good time for people to have been migrating. And mammals wouldn't have been migrating during this time because there was no food on the land. And this is thousands and thousands of miles. But if we look prior to the last glacial maximum, this is what North America looked like. There was a land connection between the Eastern and Western hemisphere. There was plenty of food on the land. We know that mammals were migrating during this time. We know that from the, the paleontological record. So prior to 24,000 years ago, and at different times over the last 2 million years, there was a land bridge between what we know today as Alaska and Siberia, and there was plenty of food on the land for humans and mammals to migrate. So what did it look like in Siberia or Northern Asia uh, during that time? If you look at this map here, you can see um, there's Africa, there's parts of Asia. Early humans were in Northern Asia as early as 2.4 million years ago. There are a number of archeological sites in Siberia that date from 24,000 years 
to over 300,000 years before present. So during the time that there was a land connection and there was no ice, there were many communities in Siberia. Now, for people to get to Siberia from Africa, they walked over 14,000 kilometers as early as 2 million years before present. So if you believe the archaeological story, or if you supposed to believe the archaeological story that most archaeologists tell, that people didn't get here till 12,000 years ago, you have to believe that early humans were in Northern Asia at 2.4 million years, having walked 14,000 kilometers from Africa, and they didn't go another 57 miles across the land bridge. That doesn't make any sense. If you were to believe the archeological story, you would look at this map and there would be no archeological sites listed in North and South America. They would only be here in the Eastern hemisphere. This is a map from a chapter I have in a book, a chapter called Singing to Ancestors, Respecting and Retelling Stories Through Ancient Ancestral Lands in the Routledge Companion to Global Indigenous History. So this map shows the sites that I have studied that archeologists have excavated and dated in North and South America that date from 12,000 to over 200,000 years, as well as showing the sites in Africa, Europe, and Asia. This map makes sense because the distance between Northern Siberia and Alaska across land was 57 miles. So if people walked 14,000 miles from Africa, there's no reason they wouldn't have gone another 57 miles and entered the Western hemisphere. And we know that a lot of mammals were, uh, were, were doing that. So the paleontological record gives us a lot of evidence. So you'll see this picture here. What do you see that's Canadian? If you look in the sky, you'll see Canadian geese. And on the ground, you'll see Canadian camels. That's because the earliest camels we know of from the fossil record arose in North America. For camels to have gotten to Asia, to anywhere else in the world, they had to cross a land bridge. So camels migrated out of North America to Siberia and Asia uh, for a long time. They made trips in both directions, going east and west and west and east. So studying the paleontological record is very important. When you're doing research, you want all the evidence you can find. So you want evidence from many different areas. Uh, another mammal that made that journey was the horse. The earliest horse in the world is known from North America. Horses arose in the Americas and to get also to the Eastern hemisphere, they had to walk. Not only did they have to walk, but it was a long journey and they needed food. So when we find horses uh, and we find them quite often early horse remains at archeological sites in um, North America and a lot in Alaska, we know that during that time, the uh, environment was viable for these mammals. We know there was a lot of grasses and foods they liked to eat. Um, another mammal that arose in the Americas is the saber-toothed cat. The earliest saber-toothed cat is over 5 million years old, the earliest fossils, and is known from an area of Florida. So saber-toothed cats usually followed their prey. That would have been the horses and the camels. So we know that saber-toothed cats migrated all over the world. If the earliest ones were here, that means they also had to cross a land bridge and they also had to have food. And so wherever they went, they were likely following horses and camels and deer and other animals. So there's a lot of evidence from our four-legged relations that there was a viable land route for migrating between the Eastern and Western hemisphere. So what are some of the sites that are on my map? Well, this one is in Cactus Hill. It's, uh, it's called Cactus Hill, it's in Virginia. This archeological site dated to 14,000 years. The McElvoys are a husband and wife team who excavated this site over a number of years. And they said, uh, because of the, um, the violence, the critique against their earlier dates, that they, 
they conducted a lot of new tests than they had ever imagined. They spent thousands and thousands of dollars redoing the dating to answer the critiques of these sites. And they said if they had to do it again, maybe they wouldn't dig so deep. And that's been a practice in North America. Archaeologists that don't want indigenous people to have been here earlier than 10 to 12,000 years ago harass and, and are very violent against archaeologists that tell the truth about their sites because it's political. They don't want indigenous people having a longer time frame in the Americas. And so archaeologists quite often have told me they have found older sites and they haven't reported them because they didn't want to deal with uh, the violence. This is a site in um, South Carolina, right across the border from Georgia. This is called the Topper site. This site was excavated by Alan Goodyear. And um, at this site, they found stone tools in a level that dated to 50,000 years before present. So Alan Goodyear said that he knew he had crossed the line by challenging the orthodoxy of North American archaeology. He said it was a weird feeling to be putting a career of 30 years on the table, but he wanted to tell the truth, so he knew there was no turning back. Um, one of the graduate students from Texas A&M University did his dissertation on those stone tools that were dated to 50,000 years. He used um, high magni magnification and x-ray to study the tools, and he said they are definitely human-made tools that were used to cut grass. So this site has been strongly proven to be a site in North America that dates to 50,000 years but many archeologists still do not accept it. Here's a site on Vancouver Island, well, sorry, on Triket Island that dates as early as 14,000 years. And this um, discovery lends support to the oral history, which has long said that people have inhabited the area for generations. So one thing I do in my research is I also study uh, different communities' oral histories. And I have been able to link oral history from a site on the Palm de Terre River, which isn't that far from the Mississippi River, to the oral traditions of the Osage people. So the Osage people said that there had been a battle between beasts, and it hadn't been safe to go on the land because there were so many of these big beasts, which were mammoths and mastodons. But when the beast had this big battle, a lot of them killed each other. And the Osage then, then found it safe to go on the land. So to honor those animals, they burnt their carcasses there and they had a ceremony there every year. And what did archeologists find there in the late 1900s? They found an archeological site with a lot of stone tools and a lot of burned mammoth and mastodon bones. So we know that oral tradition also supports the archeological record. And we can be, weave both of those pieces of knowledge together to better understand that site. Uh, this is a site in uh, Chile along the coast of Chile called the Monte Verde site. This is Tom Dillahay. When he reported his dates on this site at 12,500 years, which was older than Clovis, um, archeologists got really angry and he lost his funding to work on this site. He had all those archaeologists come down and look at the site and look at the artifacts and go over his research, and they had to apologize to him, and he was able to get his funding back to continue working on this site. There is another, a second site here now that dates to 33,000 years. This um, site is, is a really what we call a rock star site. There was very good preservation. There was uh, leather from tents stone tools, medicines, plants, foods. Um, this site was, was just wonderful for evidence. So Pedra Ferrada is a site in uh, central Brazil in the Amazon. It, it's an important collection actually of over 800 archeological sites. Um, and it includes many sites with rock paintings that date to earlier than 12,000 years. Some of the sites at Pedra Ferrada have been dated to 50,000 years. Nidi Guadon is a European and Brazilian archeologist and she faced a lot of scrutiny, but she kept reporting and publishing um, all of her dates. She has now turned this entire area, she raised funding and turned it into a national park. So all of these archeological sites um, are protected. 
So when we're looking at archaeology sites, there's three or four main things we need to have before we can publish that site in an academic journal. We need to have undeniable artifacts that were made by humans and indisputable context, which would be like if we found this stone tool in the ribs of a bison, that gives us context to the age of the bison. You need a valid and reliable control over stratigraphy. You need to see that the soil has been minimally or not disturbed at all. And you want dates on your materials and soils, preferably from three different labs. So it's a lot of work to prove that you have an archeological site for a specific date. So once again, here's the uh, sample of Pleistocene sites. I have about uh, 240 sites on these maps. I'm uh, going through my databases and adding more sites as I find them. And I, I know of over 4,000 sites and I have a, another 500 in my database. So I'll be redoing the maps in the book probably within two years. When we look uh, at an archeological site, what we want to see is not just one archeological site, but we wanna look around for the recorded evidence for other sites in the area that might have the same kind of stone tool technology and the same dates on the site. So the number one site on this map is the Coates Hines site. I went to this area in Tennessee um, and I experienced the landscape and I visited the area of some of these other sites. All of these sites date to around the same time as the Coates Hines site, and they all have butchered mammoth bone and some have stone tools. So with this information, I know that we have a regional area and there were many communities of people living in this area of Tennessee and Kentucky um, 14,000 years ago. So this is a, a picture of me here at the Lucina site in Southwest Nebraska. The Lacina site dates to over 18,000 years before present. Numerous archaeologists and field schools took place at this site over 11 years. Uh, this site was excavated by Dr. Steve Holen, who I did my field work with at the Denver Museum of Nature and Science for my PhD. And what I'm doing here uh, on the right of this picture is I'm collecting a piece of mammoth bone that is eroding from the cliff face. So you can see in front of this big berm, the pile of rock berm, this is the area that was excavated. But the cliff face on both sides of this area still holds artifacts. And archeologists go out every single year to collect any artifacts that are actually eroding uh, from the cliff face to preserve them for research. So the number one site here is the Lacina site and doing my research on ar archeological sites reported in this area, I found a number of other sites that all date between 14,000 to 18,000 years. All of these sites have uh, evidence of butchering of mammoths and mastodons. So indigenous people like to use mastodon bone for making tools. A mastodon femur is so big that even a short-faced bear couldn't get his jaw around it and break it. The only way to break open a mastodon femur bone is to bash it with a boulder. And that's what people were doing. They wanted the marrow from the bone and they wanted the bone to make stone tools. So once again, I've shown that there's an area of archeological sites that creates a regional area where people were living between 14,000 and 18,000 years ago. This is uh, an area along a connector road. In, in Southern California, there's two roads that go north and south. Highway 5 goes along the coast. Highway 50 goes along uh, the mountains on inland. They wanted to build just north of San Diego a short road to connect the two highways. When they did that, they found 114 archaeology sites. So um, it was originally called the Highway 54 site, and there were 114 archaeological sites in just a few miles on that Highway 54 corridor. Um, the sites were in Pleistocene soils. Mastodon bones were found with to be spirally fractured and placed around concentrated small rock boulders. So on this mastodon bone here on the left, you can see this nice curve on the top of the bone. We call that an impact point. 
So one of these boulders was used to bash this bone open. This site dates to 130,000 years before present. Um, Steve Holland was one of the archaeologists that worked on this site. There was a number of specialists that worked on this site. They knew that when they reported the dates, if they could even get it into an academic journal for publication, that they would face a lot of uh, scrutiny. So they waited for about 12 years. They kept all of these artifacts in the museum in San Diego, and that's where I went to study the artifacts. And then when the dating technology got to a place where it couldn't be questioned, they had the bones dated and it came out as 130,000 years. So this was published, I believe, in Science or Nature in 2017. And of course, the archaeological community was up in arms. But if we look around this area, number one is the Highway 54 site in San Diego. Number three, that dates to 130,000 years. Number three is the Calico site. Louis Leakey was the famous archaeologist from South Africa who studied all the early humans. He worked on the Calico site and he said that it dated to 200,000 years before present. <clears throat> so we see there are sites in Southern California that date between 50,000 years and 200,000 years. And just south of here in central Mexico, there are five sites around a large reservoir that have been dated by the United States Geological Survey, and they date between 50,000 and 200,000 years. So once again, we see a regional area where the evidence states people were living here between 40,000 and 200,000 years ago. So this is uh, just some... Um, pictures of me doing field work. What I'm doing in this picture here on the top left is I'm rolling out casting material. So just like, like if you broke your arm, you'd have a cast. There's a mammoth bone down here. You can see it on the ground that eroded out of this cliff face. And so what we're doing is we're, we're casting the mammoth bone. And so the cast will dry hard around it and then it will go to the museum where it can be studied. Um, the picture on the top in the middle, this is the new Nebraska site. So this cliff face you see here is along a reservoir. And this soil at the top, this is around 8,000 years. And at the bottom, it's 21,000 years. This is called Pleistocene Lus. Down here where I'm standing, this soil is older. And what I'm doing where I'm standing is Dr. Holland's wife and I are collecting camel and horse bone. So a lot of um, extinct mammal bone had it er eroded from the bottom of this cliff. So we knew it was minimally around 20,000 years. Just a little bit to the west of this site, they have found a new archeological site doing excavations below this cliff that date to 42,000 years before present. And this um, picture here on the very far far left, I'm screening soil in a field in Kansas. And what we found here was a uh, butchered mammoth bone. Uh, this is a picture of me in the Denver Museum. The picture in the middle, that's two very large obsidian uh, artifacts that uh, I collected from a site I was monitoring in Northern California. And this other picture is a site in Southern, um, Southern Colorado that dated to around uh, 18,000 years before present. So I've had a lot of experience in working on Pleistocene age sites. One of the most important things is learning the geography and geology and the soils of every area that you're uh, working in. So, um, just give me a second. I began my uh, research journey by asking questions regarding the paleo environmental possibilities of Pleistocene migrations and the evidence for pre Clovis sites in the Western Hemisphere. From what I have learned, I argue that there is a vast body of evidence that supports initial human migrations to the Western Hemisphere much earlier than the accepted dates for Clovis. There are many areas of supporting evidence for the earlier than Clovis peopling of the Western Hemisphere, including paleo environmental evidence of a land connection between the Eastern and Western Hemisphere prior to 24,000 years before present, 
paleontological evidence of mammalian migrations and linguistics. Half of the language families in the whole world, more than half, are known from the Americas. Europe has four language families. California alone has 14. There are over 100, and, I think it's 180 now, language families known from North America. And that's important because for one new language to form, even within a language family, it takes around 6,000 years. So <clears throat> Joanna Nicholas is a world-renowned linguist, and she argued that for that many languages to be in the Americas, people had to be here for between 35 and 75,000 years, minimally that long. So linguistics is another form of evidence. So this is a, <clears throat> a picture of Vine Deloria Jr. He's a very well-known Sioux scholar. And he's an author of numerous books, including Red Earth, White Lies, which everybody should read, Native Americans and the Myth of Scientific Fact. Vine was a really strong critic of American archaeology. And so there's this saying in archaeology that there's two phases to American archaeology, before Vine and after Vine. Because after he got this book out and critiqued American archaeology for its fallacies, for making up stories about the Clovis people, for claiming these dates of late arrival um, without evidence, archaeologists had to pay attention. But Vine stated that unless and until Indians are in some way connected with world history as early peoples, we will never be accorded full humanity. So um, reclaiming and rewriting indigenous histories and history based on archeological evidence, oral traditions and paleontological records should not be ignored. Oral traditions are very important. And what we do when we reclaim our history and our links to the land is we push back on misinformation, discrimination and racism. So history based on archeological evidence, oral traditions, paleontological records and indigenous knowledge that informs people's knowledge of the deep indigenous past and indigenous people's links and knowledge, links to their homeland. That informs the general population's knowledge on indigenous peoples and their links to their homelands. And it pushes back on misinformation discrimination and racism, making the world a better place for all people. All people everywhere in the world have a right to tell their own stories, to share their own stories. Archeologists for decades have never listened to indigenous people. Some are beginning to. I owe a debt of gratitude to all those white settler archeologists that recorded all of these sites without their work I would have had nothing to go on. And they stuck their necks out. Some of them lost their jobs, some were fired, and they were all ridiculed for reporting earlier sites. There is no scientific basis for that in any science anywhere in the world. The basis for that is racism in American archeology. span That is beginning to change. And I hope that my book will go a long way in supporting those changes. So I am going to stop sharing my screen and um, take questions. <laughs>